I'll admit that I'm underwhelmed by the Bearcats' new hire at offensive coordinator, but I'm still optimistic about the Scott Satterfield era. I'll explain why. Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Big day we have ahead for you right here on Lockdown Bearcats. Thank you so much for making us your first listen of every day. We are free and available everywhere that you get your podcast, including right here on YouTube. So don't forget to subscribe and hit the follow button to follow us to get an alert every time we drop a new episode. Today's episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Lockdown. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn today to get started. As I mentioned, I'm Alex Frank, your host, each and every day right here on Lockdown Bearcats. So Brad Glenn is the Bearcats' new offensive coordinator, Brad Glenn. He comes from Virginia Tech, where he was the pass game coordinator and the quarterback's coach for the Hoagies in 2022. This is his 28th season of coaching I'm sorry, his 29th season. This will be his 29th season of coaching. Brad Glenn, the Bearcats' new offensive coordinator. I'm underwhelmed. I, I really am. And this is the first time since Scott Satterfield took over as head coach that I am really questioning. I'm really concerned about where the offense in particular is going to go. And when I saw the news yesterday, just like you did, when I saw the news, my one of my first thoughts was, okay, the defense is really going to have an onus on them to be really good because I don't know how this offense is going to be. I'm viewing this for Brad Glenn, and this will be his first Power 5 coordinating job. And what's interesting is, as he goes into his 29th season as a coach, Brad Glenn, I believe he's 51 years old, 51 years old. And well, he graduated college in 95. So, okay, maybe that's wrong. I don't know where I got 51 from, but anyway, first power five coaching job as a coordinator, first power five coordinating job. I'm viewing this as an experimental year for him. Maybe for Scott Satterfield. I know Scott Satterfield's coach with Brad Glenn. But look at Virginia Tech last year. They were terrible offensively. Horrible. And the comments that I saw on social media, particularly Twitter yesterday, were in, were very justifiable. Virginia Tech last year went 3 and 8. 3 and 8. They ranked 13th in the ACC and there's 14 teams. 13th in total offense, rushing and passing in the ACC last year. They averaged under 20 points per game. Somehow, that was 11th in the ACC. Quarterback Grant Wells completed just 59% of his passes for barely over 2,000 yards, nine touchdowns, nine picks. Does that spark a lot of excitement in you? Because it doesn't for me. This is an experimental year for, for Brad Glenn. He's never had a Power 5 coordinating job. He never has. Brad Glenn is... That's not right. Brad Glenn comes in with, yes, a lot of experience. He does have some experience as an offensive coordinator. And he does have some experience coaching with Scott Satterfield. And they're all really good experiences. Prior to Virginia Tech, Brad Glenn spent three seasons as the offensive coordinator at Georgia State. Georgia State set school records in points per game and yards per game. I'm sorry. Yeah, points per game and yards per game. That is right. Yards per game in 2019, points per game in 2020. Georgia State was 13th in the country in rushing in 2019. They had eight players named all-conference. They had a quarterback in Dan Ellington who amassed over 3,000 yards of total offense. Prior to that, he spent seven seasons as an associate head coach and offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach at Western Carolina. 
Last five seasons there, the starting quarterback, whoever it was, averaged over 2,400 yards passing and 600 yards rushing. Okay, that's pretty good. At Appalachian State, helped coach Armani Edwards to two Walter Payton Awards as the best FCS player of the year. By the way, Armani Edwards, this is fascinating to me. Armani Edwards became the first quarterback in the history of NCAA football, FBS or FCS, with 10,000 passing yards and 4,000 rushing yards in his career. Second all-time in FCS total yards behind who? The late, great Steve McNair. God rest his soul. Steve McNair. We all know how great he was in college, and he went on to have a great career in the NFL. But back to Brad Glenn. But what he did at Virginia Tech, his first ever Power 5 coaching job, did not go well. Virginia Tech last year offensively stunk. I haven't wa- I didn't watch a single game last year. I haven't watched a single game since Brad Glenn was introduced or hired as the Bearcats offensive coordinator. But I looked at the stats and total offense from last year. Woof. I mean, they were putrid. Virginia Tech football, for as proud of a program as they have been for the better part of the last 30 to 35 years, were terrible last year. Awful. And the Bearcats hired a coach from that staff? It doesn't really spark a lot of excitement in me. And I get it. He's coached with Scott Satterfield. Satterfield, and I was firmly expecting him to hire somebody he was familiar with. And he did. Don't forget, Scott Satterfield was on that same staff that Brad Glenn was, that coached Appalachian State to three straight FCS national championships. And just as another side note, remember Appalachian State beat Michigan in 07? Appalachian State was no pushover because they were three-time to three-time FCS national champions in a row. And I remember reading this book, and it was either Tom Brenneman or Carissa Thompson recalling how they watched App State practice the week leading up to that game, and they walked away from it saying, They really believed they were going to win. Genuinely believed they were going to win, and they did. So, there is some good to Brad Glenn. But based off what he did at Virginia Tech last year, are you really that excited about this hire? Because I'm not. Now, I'm still optimistic. Remember, the silver lining to Scott Satterfield is still the offensive play caller for the Cincinnati Bearcats. And you look at Appalachian State now and what Scott Satterfield did when he was head coach there for six years. And keep in mind that Brad Glenn is going to be a part of the collaborative effort. Look at it that way, and that right there should make you feel a little better. Again, I'm underwhelmed by this hire. I truly am. It doesn't mean I'm not optimistic still about Scott Satterfield. Perhaps Brad Glenn needs a mentor in Satterfield working side-by-side, right-hand man. This is his first Power 5 coordinating job. So essentially, yes, what happened last year was not very good, but you can wipe the slate clean. Hasn't coached, hasn't been a coordinator at a Power 5 level. This is his first Power 5 coordinating job. The offense, if Glenn is going to be the new offensive coordinator, yes, is going to be a major question mark coming into the season. I'm going to talk about it and why I'm questioning it every single week, maybe every, every single day leading up to the season. But that doesn't mean it's not going to be a good offense. I was looking forward to seeing what Tom Manning was going to bring. I'm underwhelmed again by the hire because I don't have anything to go off of. Tom Manning had a long track record. But he also had included in that track record an NFL stint. And that's why Shane Steichen, the new head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, hired him. If Brad Glenn can come in here, though, and learn from Scott Satterfield, who he's coached with before. I do think the Bearcats still are going to be fine offensively. And it's what Scott Satterfield did at Louisville that gives me confidence this season is going to be all right for the Bearcats offensively. I'll touch on that after I tell you how this episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The midway point of the NBA season is here. And now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. 
Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thanks again for making Locked On Bearcats your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. Plus, hear from big-name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast back here on Lockdown Bearcats. Alex Frank with you, your host, each and every day. The Cincinnati Bearcats have a new offensive coordinator in Brad Glenn. Again, I'm underwhelmed. He spent one season as the pass game coordinator and quarterbacks coach at Virginia Tech. It was a disastrous season for the Hokies, finishing only 3-8, and eight, ranking 13th in the ACC in scoring, rushing, and passing offense. And I'm sorry, total passing and rushing offense, 11th in scoring. But there's still reason for optimism. I still have it, and I hope you do too. When you look at what Scott Satterfield did at Louisville and how good his offenses were, I'm scrolling through game logs from his four years at Louisville over the last 24 hours since yesterday's show. And I was fascinated by how good Louisville's offense was. And... What I took away from looking at those was that running the football still works in college football. That it confirms, because running the football still works, that he is a good hire to get this team ready for the Big 12. Scott Satterfield said recently, if you read that article by Justin Williams about what the Bearcats offense could look like, and again, what this is, and being underwhelmed by Brad Glenn is probably a step back. The first really, this is the, since Tom Manning was, since Tom Manning left, this is the first really, how would I describe this? First, I don't want to say setback, but first, first, I don't don't know how to describe it. But Scott Satterfield said that he thinks about players first, then plays, then seeing a defense and how to attack it. That is a very, very good Step-by-step approach to attacking a defense to yes, attacking a defense and running your offense. What I also took away from Scott Satterfield's four years at Louisville is the quarterback is the epicenter of the offense. When you think of college football offenses, who do you think of first? Ohio State, Central Florida, Oklahoma, Oregon, USC, Clemson. 2019 LSU, probably not Louisville. Listen to these numbers. 2019, Scott Satterfield's first season in Louisville. Eight times the Cardinals rushed for 200 or more yards. Twice they hit over 300, 322 and 370. Lowest total, 77 yards. Even that's not terrible. Actually, in college it is. Eight times they hit 400 or more. Five times 500 or more. Highest total, 664. Yeah, that happened. 48.5% of total offense on the ground. 41.5% of those yards came from quarterback Malik Cunningham. Louisville in 2020 only went 4-7. and Okay, setback from 2019. Five times 200 or more rushing yards, a high of 317. Nine times 400 or more yards total offense, a high of 568. 45% of the yards on the ground, 66% of the yards from Malik Cunningham. How about that? 2021 went... Six and seven. Six times 200 or more yards, twice 300 or more, 331 and 384. Four, seven times, seven times in 13 games, they hit 400 or more yards of total offense. Four times they hit 500 or more, high of 687. 47% of yards on the ground, 68.5%. 68.5% of the yards from Elite Cunningham. And last year, five times 200 or more rushing yards, a high of 283. Seven times 400 or more on total offense, a high of 542. 49.4% of the yards on the ground, 40.4% of the yards from Elite Cunningham. So what that tells you is, what that tells me is that Satterfield's offensive system 
is going to work in the Big 12, and it's going to work for the Bearcats. It's why they have dual-threat quarterbacks in Emory Jones, Evan Prater, maybe Brady Drogosh. And it's interesting to me how Darrell Sims spent two seasons on the staff at Louisville. Pete Thomas spent all four seasons on the staff at Louisville. And they are now still with Scott Satterfield. How about that? Your running backs and your quarterbacks coach from Louisville came with Satterfield to Cincinnati. He knows what he's doing. Maybe the offensive coordinator now is a question. I don't like that because it wasn't for me when Tom Manning was here. Maybe Brad Glenn will be better than you thought. There have been surprise hires that have worked out pretty well. That's why it's important to have a little faith. Coming up, I'll tell you why you should focus more on wins and lo- you should focus more on wins and losses when forming your opinion on Scott Satterfield. We'll do that after we hear from two of our sponsors. The press release when Scott Satterfield was hired told you he was 25 and 24 at Louisville and he won eight games in 2019, et cetera. But what that offense, well, what that press release did not tell you was this. The offensive success on the field, Scott Satterfield and Louisville ranked in the top 60 in scoring in Satterfield's first three years. Excuse me, Louisville was a top 30 offense in terms of yards per game in 2019 through 21. That was after 2018 when they ranked 109th. Oh, by the way, they jumped to 24th in one year. And it's not like Scott Satterfield is walking into a bare cupboard offensively for Cincinnati. If he could do what he did at Louisville after that disastrous season in 2018, imagine what he can do at Cincinnati. It's more than wins and losses. Yes, he only won 25 games. But they didn't tell you that Scott Satterfield hit. If you you add up all those numbers I told you in segment two, if you add up the, let's see, 14, 23, 31 times in 49 games, that Scott Satterfield's offense hit 400 more yards of offense. If you 31 of 49, well, the Bearcats didn't even average 400 yards of offense per game last year. If it's more than, if it's not more than wins and losses, if wins and losses are the only indicator of your opinion on a head coach, then explain to me these two things. Explain to me how Patrick Mahomes was a top 10 pick. Did you know that he had two losing seasons in college? Explain to me then how Jared Goff was the number one overall pick if it's all about wins and losses. Jared Goff had two losing seasons in college as well. Patrick Mahomes is is the best quarterback in football right now, and Jared Goff is not a bad quarterback as we found out in the second half of last season. What I would also tell you is this. Don't let Alabama and Georgia dwarf the other good things that are happening in college football beneath them. Like Louisville having one of the best offenses for the first three years under under Scott Satterfield. They were in the top 30 in offensive yards per game in his first three seasons. That includes even when they were 4-7 and in 2020. In Scott Satterfield's full season as a head coach, he's done remarkably well. It's hard to have success, let alone sustain success in college football. You know what else is hard to do? Build upon a breakthrough season. What do I mean by this? So remember 2018, the Bearcats went 11-2, and broke through with that 10-2 and season. Everybody was back in, engaged, and, you know, so behind Bearcats football, and season ticket sales are going up, and you're excited now for the football season as a lead-up to basketball season, which at the time was still the school's signature program, and it probably still is. I remember talking to several of my colleagues on the beat who thought the Bearcats in 2019 were going to be better than they were in 2018, but maybe not in terms of their record. I mean, I had people, I had multiple colleagues, Justin Williams, Fletcher Page, Dan Horde, uh, Zach Freeze, my right-hand man at Bearcats Media. We all thought the Bearcats were going to go 9-3 and three that year. Well, guess what? In 2019, they equaled their win total. And that 2019 team was not as good as the 2018 team. It was a struggle. From the very beginning of the season, it was a struggle. 
I mean, there were games they won that they should have lost. Okay, but they built off of what they did in 2018. They came up short of the Eastern Division title in 2018. Guess what? They won it in 2019 and came within 25 yards of winning the conference championship. They won the American in 2020. Built off of going to the championship game in 2019. They then backed up their championship the next year and went to the college football playoff. It's hard to have the kind of gradual progression the Bearcats had in those four years under Luke Fickle. But Cincinnati had that. And you think about you think about teams who have broken through. Look at Emory Jones being a part of Dan Mullen's final season at Florida. Florida hired Dan Mullen following the 2017 season. In 2018 and 2019, they won New Year's Six Bowl games. They were close to going to the college football playoff in 2020 before getting upset by LSU on a foggy night in Gainesville in December. They got trounced by Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl that year. Mullen was fired in the middle of next season. Emory Jones was the starting quarterback. It happened in Louisville. They didn't really build off of their 2019 season, but they were still consistent and they were still pretty good offensively. The press release, again, wouldn't tell you that. You have to look a little deeper sometimes. Remember Clemson beat Alabama 44-16 to in the 2018 National Championship game? Did you know Clemson's only won one playoff game since then, and they've only been to the playoff twice for a program who was thought to be one of the elite programs in the country? And they still might be. Ohio State won the first ever playoff in 2014, finally broke through first national championship since 2002, undisputed champions. Did you know they have a 1-4 in four record in the playoffs since then? And they have some embarrassing losses in that stretch. Look at the Bengals. 2005, they broke through. Everybody thought they were going to have this 15-year run of immense success. It took them four years to get back to the playoffs. And that's with two wide receivers, Hoosh and Chad, Back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons. The Bengals, after 2005, the next two years, 15 and 17. They never built off of their breakthrough season. The Seattle Seahawks only got one Super Bowl out of the Legion of Boom. S.L. Price wrote a story in Sports Illustrated the week after Super Bowl 48, talking about how Seattle maybe was going to be the next dynasty in the NFL. Well, they went to the Super Bowl the next year, they haven't been in the NFC Championship game since 2014. And then the Saints, Colts, and Packers. If you would have told me in 09 or 06 or 2010 that all three of those teams were going to have one championship with their Hall of Fame quarterback, and let alone the Saints never went back to the Super Bowl with Drew Brees, the Packers never have not gone back to the Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers, and the Colts only went to the Super Bowl one more time with Peyton Manning. It is hard to have sustained success in sports and to reach the top. Don't let what Alabama and Georgia dwarf what the Bearcats did under Luke Fickle and what Scott Satterfield was able to do offensively at Louisville. You can say, well, he didn't win big. Okay, well, I mean, Patrick Mahomes didn't win big in college. He's wildly successful. Two-time Super Bowl champion, two-time Super Bowl MVP, two-time NFL MVP. Need I say more? Jared Goff didn't win big in college. Jared Goff took the Rams to the Super Bowl two years after finishing 4-12 and in their first year in L.A. At times, their offense was anemic. You know, their head coach, you know who their head coach was when the Rams moved back to L.A.? Jeff Fisher. <laughs> Remember him? I sure do. Jared Goff's wildly successful. I shouldn't say wildly, but is successful. Consistency matters. And my question is this. How different would Louisville's offense be if Cunningham wasn't hurt in 2022? When healthy, their offense was incredibly consistent. Dynamic, hard to stop. Consistency and continuity. That's what Satterfield had at Louisville. You got Darrell Sims and Pete Thomas with you now on staff at Cincinnati. Brian Brown, who was, his, who was Satterfield's defensive coordinator for four years at Louisville, he's here now. I'll have much more of that on Friday. Speaking of which, uh, tomorrow, Russ and I are doing our live room at 1230, programming no live room, not today, at 1230 Eastern Time. Tomorrow at 1230 Eastern Time, that'll be podcasted 
for Friday. Also tomorrow, a recap of tonight's game versus Temple. A full recap. I will have, I will be at the game tomorrow night. Looking forward to seeing everybody there, seeing all my colleagues and you at the game tomorrow night. Full recap of the game following a monumental game between Cincinnati and Temple. How big of a game is this? Well, both the Bearcats and the Temple Owls are 9-6 and six in the American, tied for fourth in the AAC, and they're still trying to run down Tulane and Memphis, both teams for that top three spot in the conference tournament, which it's hard to believe it starts two weeks from tomorrow. Are you kidding me? Two weeks from tomorrow starts the American Athletic Conference tournament. And what's interesting is Temple... And Temple has played 13 games since these two teams last played on New Year's Day. Temple's has won, Temple's won seven of them, but they've lost four of their last five. So a marquee game tonight. Two big games this week for Cincinnati. Russ and I will have a recap. We'll talk about the game on Thursday. And we will also look ahead to a huge showdown with Memphis on Sunday. Final trip to the FedEx Forum for the time being. That is historic, if you ask me. Thanks so much for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. For your second listen, check out our brand new podcast, Lockdown College Basketball. Experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Lockdown College Basketball is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm on Twitter at Frankie underscore Natty with two N's. And an ATI, Instagram, Alex Frank, not underscore, and email, Alex3Frank at gmail.com. That's all lowercase. Thanks as always for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. I'm Alex Frank for Lockdown Bearcats. We are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Bearcats and Temple tonight, 7 o'clock. That game can be seen, and I should know this, but that game can be seen. Bearcats and Temple tonight, second of two games, second of two meetings between the two teams. That game tonight, I, I, I go to all these games, so I sometimes forget what channel the game is on, but that game is on ESPN 2, 7 o'clock. Of course, it's also live on 700 WLW. Military appreciation, firecrackers jump rope at halftime. Thank you to all the men and women who serve in our armed forces and, and giving us the freedoms we deserve in the greatest country in the world. More importantly, the freedoms that we are thankful for in the greatest country in the world. I'm Alex Frank for Lockdown Bearcats. Have a great rest of your day. We're part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And I'll be back tomorrow right here on Lockdown Bearcats.